Broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. Welcome back for another episode of the Freight 360 Podcast. We're up to episode 190 this week. It's a special one. We have a guest we'll get to in just a moment here, but As always, welcome to Freight 360. If you're brand new, you caught us at a great episode. If you've been with us for a while, thanks for your continued listener and viewership, depending on however you are consuming our content. Keep sharing us with all your friends. Send us those questions that we get to in the Q&A section. And keep, keep sharing the good word and leaving good reviews and all that good stuff. So this episode is brought to you by Blue Book. Are you looking to quickly identify qualified sales prospects? Looking to develop trusted, sustainable business partnerships? Look no further. The Lumber Blue Book is an online directory and credit resource for the lumber and forest products industry, covering mills, manufacturers, wholesalers, and retailers. Their database of over 23,000 lumber companies can be searched and segmented to develop sales and marketing campaigns. Members receive access to real time credit and business information for companies throughout the industry. To learn more, go to lumberbluebook.com and click join today. That's lumberbluebook.com. All right, so I did say we have a guest on today. We have Paul, a.k.a. PBJ, Tall Paul, Paul Bernard Jaroslawski, if I don't hope I didn't just butcher that. But he's from Freight Caviar. Paul, welcome to the Freight 360 podcast, man. How are you? Hey, Nate, I'm doing great. Uh, Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, so real quick before we get into the show today, uh, just for anyone who doesn't know you, I mean, you're you're kind of a a mini celebrity in the freight and meme world, but uh, give everyone a little bit of a rundown on who you are and kind of what you got going on. (laughs) Uh, Thanks, Nate, for the intro, uh, and thanks for having me, like I said. So Freight Caviar uh, was born, uh, I guess, from me being a freight broker for six years. I I ran a freight brokerage with over 100 people under me, and uh, it was outsourced in Ukraine. I'm originally from Chicago, but the company sent me to Ukraine to run it. And so when I left the company, I had all these ideas for for freight memes, and it, it started off with just making stupid, funny freight memes on Instagram. I ended up building up an audience on Instagram, and then I ended up posting on LinkedIn, other social media channels. We built up an email newsletter. We started a podcast, and essentially, it was was like a fun way to have kind of like a freight broker media platform specifically for freight brokers uh, and trucking dispatchers. Nice. Well, I'm going to pick your brain on that a little bit more as we get into the show here, but uh, it's good to have you on, man. We always love having guests. Ben, how are you doing today, man? Doing well. No complaints. Nice. That's in Florida, well, so I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's good. What's what's Polish weather like, Paul? Uh, it's been actually pretty nice. It's been a nice spring. So I, I was in Florida last week. I flew back to Poland on uh, Friday night, and it's been nice and warm. It got really green uh, for the two weeks that I was gone. So it's uh, it's a beautiful spring weather. It's been like in the 60s, high 60s all week long. So no complaints on the weather here in Poland. Where nice. in Poland are you? I'm in uh, Lublin. It's just it's an hour and a half southeast of Warsaw. It's an hour west of the border with Ukraine. Okay. Do you know nice. how close you guys are? I think I asked you this before. To Zlatoria. Yeah. Uh, is that? You know that is? It's on is the that... border. It's on okay. the border. The the uh, orphanage that my wife and I do a lot of charity work for is in Zlatoria, and it's like right across the border. But okay, I really it's probably in my head. Where it is? It can't be more than a couple hours away. Uh, it's either like an hour to two, two and a half hours away at most. Nice. Speaking of weather, uh, I was in Florida for three weeks and got back to like, it was in, I think it was like 37 degrees in Buffalo where I live. And we did officially see, uh, a couple last bits of snowfall in the last week here. I hope it's all over and done with, but it's been, it was like kind of nice and warm a little bit in the last couple of weeks and I just got cold. And I think today is hopefully the last day it's uh, it's 40 something degrees right now, but we're supposed to get up into the sixties as we get to this weekend. So I, I, this is like, normally this is a nice time of year in the Northeast and it's just, it's like winter does not want to end. So, but I digress. Uh, sports recap, the NFL draft wrapped up last weekend um, on Saturday, notable, Picks there. Um, the top two QBs went first and second pick. The Buffalo Bills picked up a tight end, uh, Mr. Kincaid from Utah. 
Um, ben, did you see anything about the Steelers? Or? Yeah, they picked no. up at a good draft. They picked up Broderick Jones, an offensive tackle. They got Joey Porter Jr. as a cornerback. And Joey Porter was, you know, a huge Steeler 15 years ago. They picked up his son, who actually still lives in Pittsburgh, um, which was a really big pick. Um, Keanu Benton, defensive lineman. Darnell Washington, tight end. Nick Herbig, linebacker. Corey Trice, defensive back. And Spencer Anderson. Offensive lineman. Well, I thought what's funny about that draft is uh, I think it's the top 20 prospects get invited to be there in person because they expect to be drafted that first night on Thursday. So they want to be like be there to go up and actually um, be on stage when they get drafted. So there was three quarterbacks that went in the first round, but there was like four top prospects. And the fourth fourth one to go was Will Levis. So he and he was there. So he was a top twenty prospect. Did not get picked in the first round. So he's still sitting there undrafted at the end of the first night. Uh, he did get picked up by Tennessee, I think on uh, on Friday in round two though. So, um, but it'll be, you know, I'm always curious to see how these draft picks play out. Once you get past the first couple of rounds, it's like a it's a total crapshoot. You don't you don't even know yeah. if these guys are going to make the team or if they're going to last or anything like that. But um, never know. You know, Tom Brady was a sixth round pick. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, I, I just thought, dude, did you guys did you guys see this thing on? I think it's on Netflix. The '80s for Brady. Did you see that I at all? It's like I a, saw the advertisement for it. It's a movie they made, and it's like roughly based off a true story. I saw part of it the other night, but it tells a story about these four old ladies that all go to the Super Bowl. It was like 2017 when the when the Patriots came back when they they were down like 28 to three at halftime, and they came back to win. Um, but it like literally shows clips from the game and it's got Brady in it. It's got Gronk. It's pretty funny, but uh, yeah. So we'll see how the, how the draft pans out. I have a, I've well, hold on. Is it worth, is it worth watching? Cause I've seen the advertisement for it a half a dozen times. Did you watch it? Uh, I watched more than half of it. Didn't finish it. I probably will finish it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I was going to say, that's <laughs> enough of a review. If you didn't yeah. finish it in the well, first set, we were watching it late and we were getting tired. Oh, okay. So that's the only reason. <laughs> um, Fair enough. My other sports comment for today. So I, I got to go play Army National Guard later this month. And for the last two days of the, the week that I'm going to be gone, I'm going to be in Rochester, New York. And um, I'm going to book my room yesterday for Rochester. And I'm like, like the government rate that they book it at is like normally it caps at like 114 bucks a night. And you, you're supposed to be honored that rate by any hotel. And I'm looking, I'm like, there's no rooms available. And the ones that are available are like $800 a night. It's the PGA Championship. It's the same weekend. It's in Rochester. I'm like, oh my god! So I booked some like micro hotel, like way outside of the outside of the area. But um, it'll be kind of cool to be, you know, near yeah, the PGA well. Championship. I got to see if I could snag an extra ticket or something, sneak in there. Very cool. But, yeah, that'll be coming up in just a couple of weeks here. Dude, you so. absolutely got to shoot me a text if you can get into the gift so, shop and you make it to the. <laughs> I'm just curious, yeah. Nate. What uh, what is that government rate? Like, you get a government rate. Yeah, so well, I'm in the National Guard, and okay. um, there, whenever you're traveling on like official government business, the government, based on the zip code you're in, sets a like a daily per diem rate that they allow you to spend on food, but also a nightly per diem rate for lodging. And most national hotel chains will have a government rate that matches that federal rate that's established. So that way, because they want if they know like, hey. You know, fifty soldiers are going to be here for a week. They want they want the business, right? So they're going to honor that rate and guarantee those rooms. But um, they uh, clearly they're all booked up. You know, Got the it. majority of them are booked up with all the people that are going to be there. And I sure. totally forgot one of the ones I stayed at a few months ago in Rochester. The lady told me that I think it was like a Homewood Suites. It's like one of those extended stay places that has a kitchen. She said that every time that the PGA Championship is played at Oak Hill, I think it's like every four years or something like that. Um, they, it's like CBS or whoever, whoever covers it, they buy up the entire place, regardless yeah. of like, if they know they're going to have people staying there, they just say like, in case a golfer has a family member come in and needs a room, like they'll have, they'll have okay. room like booked out and, and they pay like a thousand dollars a night. It's insane. But yeah. anyway, to answer your question on the military or the government rate, those are set at a federal level and it's intended for like, it could be uh, someone in Congress that's traveling or a military member or sure. any federal employee, really. Got uh, it. Yeah. So that's how that works. Very interesting. Um, well, let's give a shout out to uh, friends at DAT, Ben, and then we'll uh, we'll get more into our discussion here. 
Tired of struggling to find accurate rates in the right carriers for your freight? With DAT1, you can access more than 500 million posted loads and trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus, their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24-7. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the industry. You'll get real-time rates on every lane, so you'll know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you commit to it. Plus, you get instant access to top bids from qualified carriers around the country. Check out the show notes to support us at Freight360 for a free month of DAT1. Absolutely. All right, Paul. So getting back to Freight Caviar, when uh, what year did, did you start it? Uh, so I quit my job uh, at Everest Transportation Systems. This was back in... October of 2020, and that's literally when I started. It was like I, I think my last day was on Friday, and on Monday I was at the gym, and I was like, an idea came to my mind. I was like, I'm gonna start making some freight memes. So that was <laughs> literally it went from Friday to Monday. It was just a couple days. 2020 was the year, man. That was the year for everyone that you know. I used to get all my all my news and information from like you you're, you know tra- uh, transport topics freight waves uh DAT articles stuff like that but i f- i feel like in 2020 when everyone went home we all started consuming content differently like podcasts came out newsletters uh obviously you got what you started with freight caviar cuz i remember it had to be shortly after you started i started seeing memes on like people would share them with me on like instagram and finally like i subscribed or started following you never knew who you were and then i would see your face pop up in like uh like interview videos and stuff at trade shows and events. And I was like, Oh my God. I was like, this dude has the most genius idea. Cause you, <laughs> you take the most stressful BS industry that we work in and you like, you add some comedy and some comic yeah. relief. To it, so. well, and what I think is awesome. really nice about that is like, that's probably one of the things I missed most about working inside an office free brokerage setting, right? Like the thing that you don't get when you're kind of working from home is a lot of those kind of jokes where like, you know, you kind of have to make light of it because it is so infuriating at times where like in your head, you're just dropping F-bombs and furious and about to lose your patience and your customers yelling at you and two drivers didn't say where they were supposed to be. Other guy went to the wrong place because someone gave him the wrong pickup. And it's just like, if you don't find humor in those situations, right? Like you literally just lose your sanity. And every time I see one of your memes, like it almost like, like they're so poignant. They will like take me back like mentally to situations where I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, that's why they're funny, right? Like, it's funny right. because it's true. Because, it, like, yeah. that's where the humor is. Man, you make a good point, too. Like, because, I mean, I work at home as well now. And I used to work in an office, set, like, you know, a cube farm, right? And we would all email around and, like, send messages to each other, like, just, like, funny stuff. Like, make our own memes. We used to have a, we call it the wall of shame, where we had, like, a... <laughs> Um, basically like a, a cork board that we would post up like fraudsters pictures and just like stupid, funny stuff up there. And that was kind of like our own, like little internal meme thing. And then now being at home, I don't have that. So, uh, thanks Paul for, for bringing some so, comedy to my life, man. I, I need to give credit to, to some people. Cause, uh, when I was, you know, running an office, a freight brokerage office, like we, we had access. Well, first of all, my co-host on my podcast, he runs USA transportation on Instagram. So we used to, I used to follow him back in the day and there was attention denied and I hate freight. These other pages that made freight memes. And we would always, when I was in the office, we'd be just laughing like uncontrollably at these memes and these videos. So that's kind of where I got the idea just to create a platform and, uh, and they, 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 they kind of stopped posting. So like, I mean, if they had continued to post, we, you know, like, maybe free caviar wouldn't be so popular. And I, I kind of took advantage of the fact that, you know, people want probably this daily, you know, like they want to have like a daily yeah. meme or, you know, some entertainment and education at the same time. So. Well, and I yeah, think I think it's cool too, is like you, so you guys send out a newsletter a few times a week. Yeah. I know I get it. Uh, I subscribe to it. So it's, you got in addition to all your memes and funny stuff, you guys do put out good quality news content and all that too. So make sure you guys yeah. are all subscribing. <laughs> yeah, I also think that's one of the reasons why it works. It sounds obvious and simple, but like it works because the quality stays there, right? Like it's not like one of every five kind of make me like almost every time I see one of those posts, like it makes me chuckle or like they're just they're good quality and they're funny. And I mean, like, again, to your point, it's definitely missed in the industry. And when everyone kind of went went to home, you kind of filled that vacuum. Oh. So what's the, give us the whole rundown of what you guys put out. You got the memes, uh, yeah. newsletter. what's, what's all the freight caviar content? What's it all look like? Sure. So yeah, the memes is where we started. So kind of our bread and butter, um, it kind of gets, you know, people into, uh, introduced into freight caviar, um, 
get gets them to enter through the door. And then when they, once they're in, we we present them. We have a weekly podcast where uh, so I used to run a freight brokerage. My co-host owns a trucking company, and so we we kind of have two perspectives, kind of like the trucking side and the brokerage side. Uh, and then on top of that, we we do the newsletter that comes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Kind of just gives you an insight to like you know if you don't want to go be scrolling freight waves or transport topics or other news sources, it kind of gives you like an idea like straight into your inbox. Uh, I, I definitely like replicate like the morning brew style and the hustle on that where it's it just like gives you a nice glimpse of what's going on in, in, in the industry overall uh, and the economy. So, I mean, that's, that's about it. And then we, we, we have some other videos where uh, we, we travel to conferences. We've interviewed people uh, face-to-face. That's been really, really neat, and people like that. So we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, we just put out a video yesterday where I visited my co-host, uh, Bob and Charlotte, last month. Uh, and that was a pretty funny video. People really like Bob. He has a great personality. And if you, if you, I'm not sure if you follow him on Instagram. But he, he puts out some really funny content from the trucking side. So overall, I mean, it's it's definitely we, we just created a, a small niche down like media company. And we, we have sponsors just like you guys do that, that help support us and help us grow. Nice. So the um, you obviously you were at TIA conference down in yeah. Orlando a couple weeks ago. I didn't get to make it. I left Florida literally like the day before it, but uh, I did see a couple videos from other people, but you're from, from you guys as well on the talks. Uh, they had the panel up on the, on the stage talking about the double brokerage and fraud and stuff like that. Um, I think it was, was Chris Burroughs up there and, Anne, yep. right. So can and, you, yeah. I didn't, obviously I wasn't there, but sure. Take us through kind of like what, What's the what's the latest on that? Because I, I got to talk with them and go to DC in September last year when we, um, okay. the capital or the the capital form or whatever it's called. But w- so what what are they saying now? Before? So yeah, with the dip in the freight market, there's been a drastic increase in in cargo theft and uh, freight scams. Like uh, so, not even like like putting aside double brokering. Like I'll just say there is double brokers that. Double broker the load, but we'll pay the trucking company. Yep. There is double brokering scams that has been a huge increase where double bro- double brokers take the load or they're they're fraudulently taking loads and not paying the carriers. Uh, so there's been a huge increase in that ever since the freight market dipped because all of these people that are mostly overseas somewhere or you know in certain hot spots in the U.S. I mean they have to find other ways to to make money. So it's just kind of crazy because it's like if, if those people, you know, which are pretty smart, you know, but they're obviously doing unethical things. If they just took all that energy uh, and time and invested themselves into doing something that's moral and ethical, they'd be very successful. But instead, they, they, they try <laughs> to focus on yeah, they try to focus on how just how to be, you know, shady, unethical and bad people and stealing from people. So, yeah, drastic increase. Overall, and um, it, was, it was interesting to hear the panel. And uh, on that panel, there was uh, the CSO of Triumph Pay, uh, Garrett, uh, really smart guy. And Triumph Pay, uh, as a, uh, as you both are aware, like they, they, they do factoring, so they have insights into a lot of uh, you know the financials. And I think they estimated that between five hundred and seven hundred million dollars worth of freight uh, is like double brokered or fraudulently. Uh, you know, it's, it's fraudulent in, in activity inside of the uh, that revenue, and so that's that was from Garrett. And then we had a couple of perspectives. Uh, there was uh, uh, from Alan Lund, Kenneth Lund, who is the vice president. Uh, I forgot but the brokerage division, if I'm not mistaken, and he was kind of giving his stories and insights. Uh, and there was one more presenter. It was just it was a really great panel, and it kind of showed uh, what companies are doing in order to, I guess limit that and highway came yeah. out highway announced during tia that they they raised uh they partnered with the triumph and they raised some money through triumph uh in order to to kind of uh get rid of the the scammers and the fraudulent players yeah so it's it's funny and ben and i have talked about this on the show before but if i go back to like my early days in brokerage double brokering what that meant to me was like what you first said uh someone would take a load as a carrier and then they would rebroker it for less and still pay the actual carrier. 
And we oftentimes would never find out about it. And if we yep. did, you know, we would flag them on our system and try to report them and whatnot. But it definitely has changed. And I've seen it a lot personally the last like six to 12 months where they went from operating and actually paying people to now saying like, you know, they're, they're either um, rebrokering it at a way higher rate with no intent to ever pay the, the yeah. real driver and they take a quick pay and they just disappear. Or they're not even a carrier. They'll call in and steal someone's identity, pose as that carrier, yeah. get the load from the broker, and then they go ahead and they pose as some other broker stealing their identity, and they broker it out at some ridiculous rate to, uh, or to, you know, to another truck. And sometimes it's triple, quadruple brokered. I mean, I've seen stuff that I never thought I would see, at, you know, ten years ago in this industry. So it yeah. has gotten nuts. But I'm curious, Ben, what do you got? I was going to say what you guys were both referencing in regards to double brokering, like my first customers were co-brokerages. And in fact, even when I think about it, some of my other large customers, they were also technically co-brokerage agreements. Like even my my agreement with Maersk, they're technically a broker. We were a broker and then we booked a truck and I worked with a large trucking company. So like that objection came up like every day because that was one of the markets I went after when I first worked at TQL was other brokers that didn't have enough trucking capacity to meet their customers' demands. So I would sell them on a co-brokerage agreement. We would help them cover the loads that they couldn't get covered so they look better for their customers. And then as they scaled up, we would help basically fill in that demand, which is totally okay. I think, and one of you mentioned this, as long as there's an agreement in place and everybody is aware of what's happening, right? Yeah. There's nothing inherently either illegal or illegitimate about doing it when everybody in the process is aware of what's happening. But to Nate's point, you know, once rates skyrocketed during the pandemic, there was just so much money in the market yeah. that I think, you know, lots of fraudulent people ran into the market for exactly that reason. Like you can make tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases before the care even found out and then they would fold the business and then just start a new one. Which and then happened like before, Paul, but and like what Paul was saying, once the market dried up and they couldn't do it and get away with it, they just started not paying people and scamming people out of money, taking quick pays and all that stuff. So yep. it's kind of like the whole thing how like fuel advance fraud used to be a thing back in the day when yeah. someone would pretend that they would take a load from you, not actually have a truck and go pick it up or quote unquote claim they picked it up and ask for a fuel advance. And if brokers weren't asking yep. for stuff like a signed bill of lading showing it was picked up, talking to the customer to verify it was picked up. Um, there's people that would get away with that stuff. And they would they tended to do it more frequently around the busy times of year, like your Memorial Day weekend, uh, 4th of July. Like when, when freight would pick up and get busy and people didn't have, a, they chose to not take the time to vet everyone out properly and they would just try to slide stuff through to make money. That's when you would get scammed. But I'm curious, Paul, back, you know, now that things have changed and gotten fraudulent, um, has... What is the, did they did the panel talk about what the FMCSA is trying to do? Or are they going to? Because I remember when I was there last year, there there was like eighty thousand complaints, and they didn't do anything about any of them. Yeah, it, it doesn't they, seem they like claim to do anything now, or what? Where are we at? It doesn't seem like the FMCSA is doing much in that regard. I mean, typical I government program. Or yeah, exactly. Like, there's a lot of complaints, not much being done. Uh, I don't think. I think they're more focused on. Uh, figuring out how to create more transparency between the broker and the carrier. Uh, and that's something that uh, the, the letter came out last week. Uh, Benjamin? It's asinine. No, I was just <laughs> going to say, the fact that like they're not looking at this problem, that like, again, according to what you said, Triumph made a statement that it was something like, what, five to $700 million? Yeah. And I think it's even larger than that, to be honest. Yeah. And again, um, I mean, huge issue. And it's like, let's not look at this. And again, just think about it from a simple standpoint, like, what crime doesn't become more prevalent when there's no enforcement, right? If you just stop giving people speeding tickets, guess what people will start doing more of, right? Yeah. <laughs> Driving above the speed limit. Like it's kind of common sense that you need some type of penalty if you want to prevent some type of activity. I would, but I thought about this too, because I agree. But like we we can all we can all agree on the fact that a lot of this illegal operations, all these operations, they happen outside of the United States, right? Whether it's in Europe or in India or wherever, right? I've seen, I had literally a double broker situation like in the last few months where we sent out a GPS link and the fraudster meant to forward it onto the real driver, but accidentally initiated it and he was in Azerbaijan. Like, 
<laughs> you know, like this is they, they, there's like cells yep. of people in Eastern Europe and in those areas that are doing this. So how do you, how does the United States enforce a penalty on a, a foreign entity if they're just going to fold so, and you know collapse their authority? I had some knowledge on on all of this. Um, I actually visited a country in the Caucasus uh, two years ago where a lot of this is very prevalent. Six percent of my audience is from the base out of this country. What country mm-hmm. is it? Can I ask? It's Armenia. Armenia. Okay. Yeah. And that's why, okay, first of all, well, I hope not to get into trouble with this, but I've received threats from, from people that I, I, I talk to loudly about this topic. I have a video. It's actually one of my most viewed video on YouTube. It's a double broker in capital of the world. And it was my trip to Armenia. Essentially, if you look at Glendale, California, it has the largest diaspora of Armenians uh, in the world. And oh. so... What, what happens is, and everyone knows that Glendale's infamous for, for yep. double brokering and all that. And I have, just to be clear, I have a lot of friends that are from Armenia. My, one of my best friends in high school is from Armenia. So, like, there's yes. nothing against the people. They, they honestly, I, I feel like, it, historically speaking, they've always been at the crossroads of just, like, geographically speaking, between the Christian and the, the Muslim world, where they've been always kind of like, they've been... Uh, they've gone through a terrible history in terms of like just being destroyed and they, they've found a yeah. way to, you know, survive. Right. Yeah. Um, and I feel like they, they, they kind of have this point of view where it's like, okay, like as long as they're not like hurting anyone, it's okay. Right. And a lot of these crimes like cargo theft or double brokering, for example, like, you know, uh, at least for cargo theft, like the insurance companies will pay it out. Right. That's kind of like the point of view. And, so I visited it and I met a lot of great people, but overall, I mean, what I heard was that on basically almost every corner of Yerevan, their capital, there's a double brokering office. Wow. And if you go it's on a Instagram, it's crime though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, you go on Instagram, these companies actually have Instagram profiles where they're like, you know, all in Armenian showing they're going to learn U.S. logistics companies and you're going to learn about being a U.S. logistics dispatcher. Uh, and when I, when I talk to people over there, it's like, well, they just came back from war against Azerbaijan. They were young, you know, in the early 20s. With, you know, honestly, they could go get a job that pays $400, $500 a month, or they could go, you know, and be a double broker and make, you know, a minimum, like probably 2000 to like, I met, a, I met an 18 year old that was making 8K a month, you know? So like, wow. and yeah. just to build on top of that, like one of them was like, uh, his mom came up to him and, was, and he was like, Yo, like our your cousin has this logistics job in the US. He seems he seems to be doing pretty well. Like you should you should go, you know, work for them, you know. And it's like they they go there, they get hired. Uh and you know, essentially it's like they don't even know if it's a bad, you know, exactly. it's a bad thing. They get trained that that's oh. I was going to point that out. Like we've had a number of people reach out to us for training requests, right? And when we've evaluated, you know, just get on a discovery call to learn about their business and what they're doing and mm-hmm they are absolutely ignorant to the fact that this isn't an ethical way of doing business. They're trained that way. It is if is as if this is the way everybody does it, they don't know anything different than that. They don't yeah. have another counterpoint or the ability yeah. to say, because again, they take a job, your boss trains you to do something. You're trusting that this company is teaching you to do things above exactly. the board. So, I mean, I've been in those calls where I was just like, I remember Nate and I've been in a couple of them together. We're just like, yeah, that's double brokering. And they're like, what do you mean? This is brokering. We're like, you can't just take a load off a load board and then broker it to somebody without them knowing. They're like, yeah, but that's where all the freight is. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had, I had no. two quick stories. I had a guy last year that I talked to, he reached out to me and he's, he's, he knows that I run the, the agent division for Pierce worldwide. And he's like, he's like, Hey, you know, you guys take on any new brokers. And I talked to him and I was trying to figure out what his business looked like. And he's like, you know, He's like, you know, when the market's great, you know, my volume's up. When it's market's slow, it goes down. I'm like, what do you move? He's like, well, whatever I can find on DAT, you know, on the load boards, I, I'll grab those loads and I'll go find a carrier for them. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, that's, that's not how it works, man. You can't take another broker's load and then rebroker it without them knowing. And he literally was trained that way. Yeah. And that's what he thought he was supposed to be doing. So like, there's the ignorance part of it, but it wasn't even any, you know, malintent. The other one, I had a guy that, it was a carrier that was hauling a load for us. This is probably last year as well. And the truck that shows up has a different name and MC on the side. And I, I call him and I was like, Hey, like, um, what's going on here? 
and he's like, oh, he's like, you know, I didn't have a truck available. So I called my buddy and I just hired him to do it. And I'm like, you can't rebroker a load as a carrier. You ha- if you don't have a truck available, we'll contract your buddy and set him up as a carrier, but we can't put it through you and have you invoice us. And then you pay him like that. That's double brokering. And he had no idea that that was not okay to do. So there is, you know, to, to their credit, if they're just trained or they think what they're doing is, is, uh, the right way of doing business, there's, there's no malintent behind it, but, uh, that doesn't, it's not really a valid excuse either way, but there are 1000%. There are people that fully intend to just scam people. And that's where these, these non-payment, um, quick pay fraud scams are, you know, we've been seeing those lately. So I have a question for Paul. I mean, you're intimately aware and understand where this is happening. What would you suggest could be done to Nate's point? I mean, they're in another country. They don't have recourse. And I mean, the only only reason I think I'm, I think for our audience that I want to say is in the instances where I've been involved, like the FNCSA hasn't done anything, but it's still wire fraud and you can report it to the local authorities, DAs. And I've seen repercussions play out in the U S from that. But what do you do in a situation that you've just explained? What could they do? What is there that could be done? At the end of the day, uh, well, the majority of them have registered MC in the States. So someone is right. registered on that MC. Like we yep. all know, Glendale, California is a hotspot for that. And, uh, you know, it's like you got to track down who's setting these up because someone's setting these MCs up. And That's what, true. Yeah. What I what I did hear, though, when I was uh, at TIA, there's there's a guy, Dale, Dale Praxton. He, he, I think he came up with this application called CarrierVerify.com. And he was telling me that, like you like the FMCSA doesn't double check any of like when you fill out like an MC registration form, it doesn't actually like double check anything that you're a U.S. citizen and like it doesn't. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. it's like he was telling like you don't, require your naturalization document like, or your green it card. Says, or it says that you have to be a U.S. citizen or, or U.S. Yeah. Like yeah. not even a U.S. citizen you just has to be a resident or whatnot. But it doesn't actually like double check it. You just kind of could put in like any BS if you want. So I that's that's what I heard overall, and I mean it seems like there's a lot of promise you fixed at the you know FMCSA level, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell you this. One of the things that I like, I know you mentioned Highway was there. Um, I we use Highway at my brokerage for every single new carrier. We we double check them, and there's and there's other platforms out there as well that do this. Well, they will give you insights on the data, like. Has that address or email or phone number or name been reused on a different authority, right? Has it been no. used on four other brokerages or carriers in the past? Is there a brokerage that has a matching address as that, no. you know, asset-based company? So there are definitely tools out there. Um, I just, you know, I would like to see there be actual like, uh, you know, bring down the hammer on some of these fraudsters that have been getting away with it for so long. Cause until somebody is made an example of w- why would you not, you know, yeah. continue operating the way you are? I so. mean, there yeah. was one person that like got into a lot of heat and his I, entity. I ju- yeah. I remember but, that. I was just going to mention that yeah. there was like a, a brother. There was definitely one guy that was like all over the news. I remember yeah. like watching a news story showing him like literally giving out Rolexes to his sales yeah. teams at like the end yeah. of the month. Like, like uh-huh. crazy spending, right? Like yep. completely egregious, like driving Ferraris, handing out Rolexes. I mean, like, and they caught them. And I remember them going back. I know there was a court case. Do you remember how it played out? Or are you aware of like what? I'm pretty sure the man's free. He, I don't think he ever spent a day in jail, to be honest. <laughs> so, wow. And I'm pretty sure well, his, he's still running and operating all the businesses. So just... So de- definitely a uh, good, good discussion on double brokerage and the updates on what the latest and greatest is. Uh, didn't intend to talk about that this whole episode, but it's, it's good discussion either way. And I'm, I'm glad, we're, glad we're doing it. Uh, I do want to pivot here and, and talk CRM for a bit. So uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is uh, one of the products that, that you recently launched and kind of where it's going to go. And it's uh, it's a CRM and a, essentially a lead generation tool. And to, I'll, I'll let you talk about it in a second here, but to kind of pitch it to you here or set you up here with a, a softball pitch. Um, th- one of the biggest th- reasons that I think a lot of people fail in this industry is that they don't, they can't get business. And it's not that they're not good at sales. They don't necessarily even know where to go to find prospective shipping customers and things like that. 
Um, and in, in, in addition to that, they're not organized. They don't have a proper CRM or customer relationship management system to organize all their leads and to track progress with phone calls and uh, any text or email conversations that they've had. So um, tell us a little bit about the product that you recently launched. I know it's kind of in the beta phase, but uh, okay. just kind of lay that out for us. So yeah, we're in the beta phase. We, we do have paying customers. We have plenty of users. We get lots of feedback and that's kind of what we're, we're utilizing to develop it. Uh, but What's the name of it? It's shipperscrm.com. You could also just type in findshippersfast.com. We bought that domain, uh, find, findshippersfast.com. But overall, right now, what we're really focused on is building out like a shipper database. I know you mentioned, uh, Nate, ahead of time that uh, Blue Book is like a sponsor. And essentially what we want to do is do what we might actually partner up with some, someone like Blue Book. But overall, uh, have a database overall for all shippers. And it's, it's like we, you're going to go into our shipper database and you will have a list of, let's just say, like you'll have a whole list of shippers. You could click on that shipper. You'll pull up some kind of overall like information on it, like what does the company ship? What kind of equipment do they typically use? What's their revenue? Uh, wh where are their locations? You know, you could click locations. It'll pull up all the phone numbers that you need to call them. And then let's say you want contact information for the, the, the key contacts of the shipper. You can pull up the key contacts. You can look at their LinkedIn profiles. You could add that that person into your CRM, or you could export that contact if you want, if you have a different CRM. So we essentially combine the lead gen tool plus a CRM. The CRM functionality right now is is very basic. It's something that we're going to get to uh, sooner or later. But if you want to use it as a lead gen plus CRM tool, that's all. anyone can do that. But overall, we want to have the best shipper database that exists out there because. One of the difficulties, uh, at least when I was a broker, is like, well, okay, like you want to call a shipper, you want to you want to get new leads in the door. It's like, well, where do I start? This is the gr best place to start. So that's what we that's what we created. And uh, just just to, if anyone wants to try it out right now, they could go to findshippersfast.com and start a two week free trial. Yeah, what what I think is cool is I think you're solving two big issues that Ben and I have mentioned throughout the years of doing this. It, and the first one is. Um, and I think it sounds like you'll get there with time uh, as the CRM side of it, because um, <clears throat> unless you've got a proprietary TMS that has a custom built CRM specifically for freight brokerage, you've got a generic CRM, right? Whether it's a HubSpot or a Salesforce or whatever, they're not designed specifically for freight. They're designed to try and be an option for any industry that's out there, whether you're selling insurance or houses or cars, right? There's not a lot, and you know, there's, you can customize fields and stuff like that. But like, I personally use HubSpot and there is so much extra stuff in there that I don't need, but I have to pay for if I have a, a sales CRM package with them. Right. Yeah. Uh, not to mention if you go to one of their higher levels that includes like email campaigns and um, insights into how somebody found your website and all that, all that good stuff. But so you, your, your goal is to create the best CRM for freight brokers. That's really open market that anyone can buy, right? Yeah. So I think that's the first thing that you're solving. And the second part is you named all the, the kinds of data points that you guys are trying to have available for somebody, a customer of yours to see, right? What commodity do they ship? What equipment type is it? These are all the things that we have to do in our phone call, our prospecting calls with a shipper, right? You know, we're trying right. to figure out what do they ship? How many loads a week do they ship? What's their annual revenue? What's their freight spend? Who are the points of contact? And we have to do all this manual research, whether it's through their website or through LinkedIn or whatnot. And I think what you what you guys are creating is a, is a way, it's obviously a, a paid pay to play kind of thing, but someone can exchange their money for getting all those answers, right? And that saves them time so they can make more calls and, and sharpen their skills as a broker, both on the sales and the operation side. So I think I don't know of anyone else that's come, up, come out with a product like yours. Um, I, I know obviously companies like Zoom Info, you can go grab a lot of uh, you know point of contact information and stuff like that, but they're super expensive. So yeah. I think you guys have found a niche that that needs to be um, needs to be serviced, and I think you guys are going to hit a home run with it once you know things fully launch and you take take it off. So yeah, we're really excited about it, and like you said, like no one's really done it. Uh, and we're, we're combining two things that are necessary for the industry. So we're really excited. What did you, let me ask you this, Paul, when you were, when you were working as a broker, what did you use for a CRM? Did you have like a, an in-house proprietary one built in or did you guys use something external? So, uh, when I was, I was a career sales rep 
uh, okay. for the majority of my time. When I owned a brokerage for a few months, uh, I didn't have a CRM. <laughs> I would, I would, I just knew a few contacts that they gave me some loads, and then on top of that, I would just scour around Google Maps and just call uh, shippers from Google Maps, which is, which is actually what we what we did was we integrated Google Maps into Shipper CRM. So there's a Google Maps feature where you just click on Google Maps in our Shipper CRM, and when you pull up a shipper, it will. Uh, it will give you the ability to click LinkedIn and you can see all the, the people that are on LinkedIn from that company, or you could just add that company directly from Google maps into your CRM. So, nice. uh, yeah. So I think the, the takeaway, I know we're, we're kind of short on time here, but the takeaway with, with a CRM, if I had to summarize it for anyone listening or watching is, um, in my opinion, you need to have something that you're using as a CRM, whether it's yep. even just an Excel sheet, cause you don't have, you know, 10 bucks or 20 bucks a month to go buy something that's cheap or even use a free one that's out there that's limited. You got to have something to, to organize all of your prospects and your leads and your customers too, and a place to store information about them and, and really track your progress. Um, you know, how, you know, when's the last time you followed up with them? Can you set tasks, things like that? I think if, if someone's not using a tool like that, and hopefully Shipper CRM will get to a point where it does all of that and more. Um, but if you're not doing that, I think people are doing themselves a disservice and you know, they're, they're not efficient with their, the use of their time. So totally. um, there's we got plenty of other content on CRM. You guys can check out Ben, what do you got? I just wanted to add one final point. The other thing that becomes very difficult is if you're using an Excel sheet or anything, even if it's organized one, it's very hard to keep your conversations you've had. So you lose usually what you've talked to them about because there's not really much space, but even if you do all of that and you build your own database in Excel, what is inevitably going to happen is after a few days or weeks, you get to this place where you just start looking at all of them together. And then you start going, well, who do I want to talk to today? I don't feel like, yeah, that's now maybe that'll be a good lead. And you spend more time trying to decide who to call than you actually do end up even calling. Right. And yep. just some of that basic functionality takes that right off the table and allows you to just literally take action. Because if you're not, your business won't succeed. Right. It's as simple as that. If this task isn't done and done consistently and well, no one has a business. I mean, it's really exactly. great. Oh. Well, good stuff. Um, good discussion. We got some Q&A to, to wrap up with here. Um, but first, a shout out to our friends over at Lean. Are you looking to take your freight brokerage or agency to the next level? Look no further than Lean Solutions Group. They are industry leaders in nearshore staffing for logistics companies with offices located in South America, Mexico, and the Philippines. They offer a wide range of exciting positions, including freight broker back office operations, accounting, tech and web development, business development, marketing, customer service, and more. Don't miss out on the opportunity to work with the best in the business. Visit them online at leangroup.com to learn more about the exciting solutions they have for your brokerage or agency. All right. Our first uh, listener question is about tonus. Should tonu charges and payments fluctuate as freight rates do? I like this question and I'm curious what you guys think in a, in a brief answer here. Cause um, the first thing I'll say is Tonus, if a customer cancels a load on you, they tend to have a schedule of their accessorial charges that they're going to pay, whether it's uh detention layover, Tonus stuff like that. Um, but I don't know that I have even considered the thought of inflating or deflating Tonu rates based on where the economy and where the market's at. What do you guys Briefly, what, uh, what do we think about that? So I think Tonus should actually, well, since we've all seen inflation rise, I don't know, like 30% in the last three years, maybe even more, depending on, you know, specific factors. But overall, like a Tonus has been 150, I guess, uh, ever since I was a broker. I'm not sure when it was cheaper than that. But in my opinion, the like, so charges should, should rise when inflation rises. Just my two cents. Yeah, I would I say it's probably even in addition to inflation, it's really where the inflation in the freight market is, right? If rates are higher versus lower, like freight rates are down right now. So should a tono, tono be cheaper now because you're mm -hmm. foregoing less? Nope. Potential I will go two no, different so we're, ways. Okay, we're going with uh, inflation. Got it. If you look <laughs> at it as a function of the actual rate per mile, you can argue that like rates are now kind of probably even lower in some cases than maybe even a decade ago. But to, I think, Paul's point, like we just did all this work on our trucking course. So spent a lot of time digging into what it costs to run a trucking company. And those numbers are absolutely up, right? Their fuel's up, their wages are up because it costs more money to live now. So the driver's got to be paid a little bit more. 
the cost for your equipment has gone up, all of their expense and maintenance is up. Literally every single one of their expenses are probably up anywhere from 15 to 30% over the past three or four years. So their break even cost to run a truck four or five years ago was like a dollar 83 a mile average. Now it's like just over two bucks a mile. And yep. I think to Paul's point, the whole point of the truck order not used is to pay you for the time on the work you thought you were going to get and also make up for what now they got to go find a load, right? So again, if you got this truck booked and they're sitting there, they're burning more of their wages, more of their fuel and more of their maintenance and equipment costs. So I think there's a very good argument that they probably should be a little higher or yeah. maybe not a ton, but at least 175 to 200 because drayage access oils go up with inflation. And like yeah, what you see point. in drayage access oils, they all go up when that happens. Like, Sure. So, yeah. And it depends. I, I, what I would say also is like, well, if the driver, you know, drove for two hours uh, and just got into the shipper dock and then like they're like, oh, the load is canceled versus, you know, the load is canceled, you know, a few hours beforehand, no driver mood for it. I mean, those are two different scenarios and I think they should be compensated differently for it. Agreed. So. Yeah. And we've talked about that and we broke down tonos in detail and some of our other content. Um, but I agree. I, and I would definitely make sure you have a, you have an understanding with your customer on what, what their rules are on uh, paying for a tonu. If it's, you know, is there a cutoff time and, and all that stuff of, you know, how early they cancel it. So uh, good stuff. All right. Next question. Where should I look for jobs as a freight broker if I'm looking to make a move? Uh, so if you're already a broker looking for a new job, um, job boards are good, right? Like Indeed has a bunch of postings, ZipRecruiter. There's there's a specific like logistics recruiters that are out there. Um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. In. What's that? That's what I would recommend. Yeah, I would say if you have a book of business to our industry, if you have a book of business, email myself or Nate Benjamin at Ship BTB or Nate at Pierce, and we'll both look at what your book looks like and see if we maybe find a home for you over here as well. Yeah, that's specifically for the the 1099 agent model. Um, but um, if you're W two, I'm with Paul. Yeah. Like the, the recruiter, because I've seen some of the guys out there, they'll have specific positions like a carrier sales rep or a dispatcher or an account manager or a cradle to grave W two. Have you guys ever used a recruiter before? I've not. So I have, but I yeah. didn't end up executing what they brought me. But yes, so I have. So just from my perspective, I used CS Recruiting back in 2017. And I had four job offers, four job interviews and four job offers within a week of just calling them. Uh, and then I had two companies that actually raised both of their base salaries for me because they both wanted me. And just so if anyone's interested, I would I would contact CS Recruiting for sure. And then uh, I also I know Pinnacle Growth Advisors out there. That's just that's just more for like a W two kind of format. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like if you're yeah, looking Brent. for options, it's it's sorry. Is that Brent or Suga? Pinnacle? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen this stuff around. Good stuff. Uh, last question: Do you have a recommendation on who to use for my BOC three process agents form? Well, so you just dug into that this week. So yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> one of the questions here. So um, if you don't know what it is, it's it's the designation of process agents. Uh, so if you're opening up a brokerage, um, you've got to have a basically a, a legal representative in all the states you're going to operate in. So you're going to do all basically everything. Um, easiest way is go to the FMCSA's process agents page, and it has a list of all the process agents that are um, set up to do all that for you. And it's pretty cheap and they'll literally designate someone in every state for you. So you're not trying to manually do it. So I don't know anybody that's ever done it manually. You just find a process agent company for freight brokerages. Like I said, use that FMCSA page. And it's like, I've seen it for 30 bucks and uh, they'll, they'll renew it anytime that has to be done. And it's, it's fairly cheap and it checks that box. So um, good stuff. Any uh, any final thoughts? I know we're at the tail end here. Actually, Paul, how do people find you? Uh, fo- well, you could find me on uh, FreightCaviar.com. Follow me on Instagram, FreightCaviar, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, and then subscribe to our newsletter on FreightCaviar.com. Awesome. Well, dude, good to have you on here, man. Happy to have you on any other time in the future. Ben, what do you, you got a final thought? There? Yeah, and final thought is we should do something where you give us either your best meme of the week that we can add into our newsletter as well. I think it would be a good addition on both. <laughs> For sure. It would allow us to give you guys traffic, and I think it'd be a good addition to the newsletter. Just kind of appreciate that. that. Definitely. Um, yeah, other than that, whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. Go Bills.
<laughs> that wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. And if you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week. 